All right. I think that's the signal to get started. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> good evening and welcome to our fourth in a series of five webinars on sustainability sponsored by the Office of Lifelong Learning. My name is Jim Casey. I am a member of the class of 1991 and currently professor of economics and core faculty in environmental studies. We have uh, what I believe to be a fantastic lineup of speakers set up, um, which I hope will generate lots of interest and lots of questions as well. Um, tonight's three panelists are gonna be helping us understand the complexity and importance of making the transition away from fossil fuel dependency to a more sustainable array of energy resources. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce the three speakers uh, and then turn it over to them, but just a couple of reminders for those of you who might be joining us uh, for the first time. The webinar will proceed as follows. After my brief introductions, each of our speakers will take approximately 15 minutes, which should leave us with about 25 minutes for questions and answer at the end. Um, in the Zoom feature, please type your questions into the Q&A feature as they come up. Um, we ask you not to wait until the end, but rather as you're thinking of them, go ahead and put them in there. Um, Rob Fury and I will be moderating those comments and going back and forth at the end to direct those questions to the appropriate speaker, uh, maybe sometimes combining ones that are similar and, and seeing if we can get in as many questions as possible. Um, hopefully, if we stay to task, uh, this program should be wrapped up in about 85 minutes or so. So with that, let me introduce our three speakers. Tonight, they include Professor Bill Hamilton and two WNL alums, Brian Folk, class of 2008, and Eric Curran, class of 1987. Professor Hamilton received his PhD in plant physiological ecology from Syracuse University. I think he also got a PhD in uh, orange basketball while he was there, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken about that as well. Um, he's been at Washington and Lee for two years now, and this is, oh wait, those are my notes from 20 years ago, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Hamilton has been here for over 20 years now, and so have I. Um, he and I are now the old gray-haired or gray beards of the Environmental Studies program, and having each been here uh, since the inception of that program. Um, in those two decades, Bill has been working with the National Park Service looking at the interactive effects of bison grazing and climate change um, on Yellowstone grassland productivity. And in the true spirit of WNL liberal arts education has always involved students in that field work um, and in data analysis, writing up of results, presentations, et cetera. And I commend Bill um, for his commitment to our students here, here at WNL. Um, Professor Hamilton will be our first speaker and we'll begin with an overview of energy resources. Uh, looking at questions pertaining to supply of the different resources and their impacts on the environment. Next up, we'll have Brian Folk, again, class of 2008. After receiving his BA in geology and environmental studies, Brian went on to receive his MBA from Rice University and an MS in geological sciences from San Diego State University, go Aztecs. His primary area of expertise is in growing energy assets and executing strategic corporate initiatives in the energy industry. He's currently operating partner at Aventurine Partners, where he assists in deal origination, evaluation, and execution. And according to his 2007 fall football picture, was listed at 6'3", 228 uh, as a senior on the WNL football team. So Bryant will be providing us insights on current developments in energy production and consumption and taking us through the enormity of the task at hand for us moving towards a more sustainable energy future. Last but not least, Eric Curran, again, class of 1987, after receiving his BA in English from WNL, went on to receive his PhD in English from the University of California at Irvine, and for more than a decade now has been working in the solar power industry. Eric has published three books on solar power and climate, act, ch climate change activism, excuse me, including one which I think is most relevant for today, given that it is George Washington's birthday. So happy birthday to one of our founding fathers. And the book is called The Solar Patriot, A Citizen's Guide to Helping America Win the Clean Energy Revolution. Eric will be concluding those presentations with a focus on the rapid development and deployment of solar technologies. So without taking up any more of your time, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Bill Hamilton. Bill? 
Thank you, Jim. And since we're on break week, I'm going to, you know, not lecture too much. But if you take a faculty member out of the classroom and we have to take the chance to talk, but it, it won't be too dense. So I was tasked with, let's move on here. Why is my, there we go. Talking about resources. And I just finished this up in my experimental botany class. We can, all of the resources on earth come from photosynthesis and understanding a basic, getting a basic understanding of that, I think is important to talk about where we are now with using fossil fuels and where we can go with utilizing photosynthesis and teasing some of the subtleties of photosynthesis out in utilizing energy from the sun and other means is, is an important thing to understand. So hopefully most of you saw this at some point in your lives, usually in high school, um, but you can see that we've got sunlight, which we didn't have much today on campus, but we, we tend to get a little bit more this time of year. The basic reaction of photosynthesis is carbon dioxide, something that's increasing in our atmosphere right now. A little bit of water, the process of photosynthesis utilizes energy from the sun as well as some enzymatic steps. And you probably all learned it as turning into C6H12O6, which is glucose. But as a plant physiological ecologist, biochemist, this is actually what happens. And then it gets turned into glucose. So I just couldn't put that up there because it's not the truth. But ultimately these things get turned into glucose and cellulose and fatty acids in plants and all of those things and oxygen. And the important thing about photosynthesis from an evolutionary standpoint of our atmosphere is that if it wasn't for photosynthetic oxygen production, we wouldn't have our atmosphere that we do now. It would be filled with CO2, we wouldn't have an ozone layer, and the earth would be a very different place. Likewise, all of this glucose gets turned into organic matter. And I'll go through where that organic matter goes in a little bit, but ultimately over time, it's going to turn into fossil fuels. But to give a little idea of, of the important part of the water splitting reactions that produce oxygen, that is kind of analogous to what photo, um, uh, photovoltaics do, as well as some emerging technologies that are related to um, utilizing sunlight, whether it's biological based or chemically based, um, uh, reactions to produce things such as hydrogen, um, we can look at what takes place in, in the light reactions of photosynthesis. I was using my cursor on the wrong screen, but plants are green, right? I think we can all agree on that. And that's because it absorbs back. We see green and blue and red light gets absorbed and energy from the sun gets bounced around and it's all about electrons. That's what electricity is at the end of the day. It's moving electrons around through power lines in a controlled fashion. And that's what photosynthesis does. It moves electrons around in a controlled fashion to produce energy, to fix carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this is the process that then splits water. The splitting of water is a process that could also be utilized for producing things such as hydrogen gas. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. But it's these electrons that we're all interested in. Um, if we can produce electricity, we would be in a really good position. Um, so park that away, but particularly when we start uh, hearing from Eric, there's, so, there's some overlap there. And I just wanted to introduce that concept. And again, I haven't been able to lecture this week. So I just want to talk about my favorite biochemical process for a little bit. So energy from the sun. This is where all of our resources come from. Again, in the early atmosphere, carbon dioxide was going into the oceans. It was being absorbed like it is today and causing acidification of the oceans, which has negative effects, but it's a natural process as well in the geologic time scheme of things. And there were organisms that could take up that CO2, turn it into organic matter, and then produce oxygen. Oxygen accumulated in the oceans, it went into the atmosphere, and then ultimately created our ozone layer, which protects us from ultraviolet light. I'm not talking about the ozone that we inhale and causes lung problems, it's the stratospheric stuff. So just to walk through this schematic, um, we've got leaves taking in sunlight and I've got Chan there. That's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. 
The previous figure I talked about photosynthesis, just making things that have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Nitrogen is what proteins are made out of. And that's what organic matter is made up of, of these four main components. And there's lots of minor things. And that's what's going to be accumulating to allow um, life to occur. And that carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen produces energy. You can burn those things and found out, find out how many calories they possess, and you can quantify the amount of energy. We take that in as food, whether you're a vegetarian and you eat plants, or you, I just had a steak for dinner. Don't judge if, it, anyway. <laughs> um, other animals that eat plants, that gets turned into um, energy as well. That chan over time, that organic matter, over millions and millions of years was compressed from different sources, pollen, um, plant tissue, dead um, sea life, um, dead animals got compressed and got turned into our different forms of fossil fuels, oil, coal, um, gas that is, that is produced during that compression. So you can think of fossil fuels as essentially stored sunlight in the form of organic matter from the sun. And we, when we burn that, we're kind of releasing that stored sunlight and liberating the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen as it's being combusted. So that's a, a key point to, to consider. But that carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen can also be used for biomass and turned into fuels. If you've ever had a fire, you've burned wood, and that is producing heat and energy. Um, and that's another for, another resource that can be utilized from plants. Plants can also be turned into biofuels. Um, the United States Navy is a leader in producing biodiesel from plants um, and other bio, other well, yeah, it's, it's from plants, different, different inputs, but producing biofuels. And that's different from just burning a plant. It's extracting the components out, the fatty acids, and turning them into things that can be combusted. And it essentially gets turned into diesel fuel. But we also have solar energy. Solar energy can be harvested um, by photovoltaics, by photo, photothermal uh, means. The library has some uh, hydrothermal that heats the preheats the water for the um, heating system in the library. Um, so we can capitalize on solar energy as well. And then in very important and an emerging area is looking at photosynthetic fuel cells. So actually using the biochemistry of plants to actually produce energy. And we're talking about electricity but also potentially producing hydrogen as a, a resource. And the issue with current hydrogen production is it's electricity intensive. Um, if you had solar around, then it wouldn't be as intensive, but actually using the biochemical um, properties of plants to actually produce hydrogen gas. And that's a really interesting um, uh, emerging technology that's a lot of research is being done on right now. So where do we stand right now with respect to our, our overall resources? And all of this data is coming from the um, Energy Information Administration, which is a independent group within the Department of Energy. Um, I wanted to go with a kind of a, a solid clearinghouse to provide you with this information. So this first graph on the left-hand side, it's, it's kind of busy, but it, it presents all the information. It's the energy production by source um, the reference case, they're referring to kind of a standard year because then they're producing, generating projections. And 2020 is the, the, the base reference case. And we can see that the prediction for natural gas resources are continuing to go up, up until 2050. And 2050 is the magic year for um, it's climate change and temperature increase and um, uh, sea level rise. And a lot of the goals have, have been set around changing things by 2050. So that's why we quite often see things for 2050. Um, we can see that crude oil or um, crude oil and lease condensate, that's something that I'm not super familiar with, but I could um, hazard a guess what that is. Um, Bryant maybe can inform us later, um, is plateauing. Natural gas, um, Nuclear is flat, as well as hydro. And nuclear and hydro are two other me means of producing energy. Um, 
that aren't necessarily utilizing organic matter, but they have their other, they have their own issues um, associated with them, whether it's damming up a river or producing nuclear waste. So in general, um, there are some uh, interesting trends, but renewable energy is predicted to increase. And we're gonna hear more about that from um, Bryant and Eric as we work our way through um, the rest of the, the webinar today. So when we look at the energy consumption by those fuel uh, cases, we can see that petroleum is definitely the largest one being consumed, then natural gas, and that has increased with um, fracking of, of shales, uh, more natural gas is being produced, and um, it's a cleaner fuel, so switching to natural gas is desirable in the short term. Um, coal has taken a well, is predicted to take a rather dramatic decrease. Um, again, uh, hydro and nuclear are kind of flat lines. Uh, biofuels are not showing any signs of really um, increasing, but renewable energy is increasing, and um, I'd like to see that line maybe increase a little bit more. So we've got the production of those components and then the actual consumption. And those, these are predictions when we look past 2020. So the, the main issue with um, the consumption of energy is, is climate change. And carbon dioxide is the main contribute, contributor to issues, not only in the atmosphere and trapping heat, but also um, acidification of oceans and um, increasing temperature uh, causing to sea level rise and things like that. So I'll, I'll show you some data on the breakdown of where these emissions come from. So the first figure here is the energy related carbon dioxide emissions um, by different areas. Um, we need to think about these things in our different daily lives and how we utilize things. And you can see that transportation is a, a major contributor to um, uh, our production of carbon dioxide, tailpipe emissions, um, moving around the globe in airplanes and such. Um, electric power is rather significant, but you can see a little um, decrease potentially here in time uh, for, for the projections. Um, industrial usage, as we increase um, our uh, economies across the globe, um, there's a predicted increase. And when we look at this, residential and commercial is relatively low um, over time, and there's no real predictions and in increases. That doesn't mean making changes in those settings doesn't necessarily um, contribute to reducing these things. And then when we look at the fuel sources that are contributing to these different sectors, um, we can see that petroleum um, is a major contributor. So um, oil um, and diesel fuel and, th and those things, but predicted to plateau, natural grass, gas in increasing over time. Um, it is a cleaner fuel, but its extraction is not necessarily um, the best for the environment, but it's not producing nearly as, as much um, CO2 as petroleum in that, that total um, production. And coal, again, is predicted to go down. So I'm going to unshare and just talk a little bit about um, where that all kind of fits together. So plants are the central component to a lot of these things. Our fossil fuels are derived from the process of photosynthesis and then things that ate that, that organic matter and turned it into fossil fuels. But I, I see the, the, at the advantage when we're going into more alternative energies and um, I, I didn't present a lot of information about that because we're gonna hear about from our, that from our other two uh, webinar speakers. Um, utilizing and um, harnessing the power of plants to produce alternative fuels, whether it's biomass um, to switch over from coal and natural gas to burn plant matter is actually a better alternative because when you burn a plant, it's carbon neutral. The plant grows back again. The carbon liberated goes back into the plant system. It's more neutral. It's not that stored carbon and that stored sunlight that was produced millions of years ago being liberated back into the atmosphere. Likewise, the photosynthetic apparatus that's, that's in plants um, can be studied. And there's a lot of great work that's emerging to 
capitalize on that biochemical process to produce um, electricity as well as uh, hydrogen gas. So I think that's about where I would like to wrap up and hand it off to Brian. Appreciate that, Bill. Um, let me start sharing. The title of my talk today is Traditional Energy Complex to a New Energy Economy. Um, could make a number of intro marks. We have a lot of materials to cover, so, so I'll get into it. The, the only high-level comment I'll make is, is a general statement, having worked in both traditional energy and, and now doing climate tech investing and, and climate tech work uh, on the decarbonization side, is, is I think most people fail to recognize just how humongous the energy complex is globally. And obviously, along with the financial system, in terms of both dollars and energy consumed resources uh, are the largest sectors of, of the global economy. So we'll try to give some sense of that and, and the, the scale of the problem we're trying to solve. Um, before we do that, it's maybe a bit redundant from last week's call, but what, what is net zero? So, so you've probably heard a lot of companies trying to achieve net zero goals, and we'll go into that a little bit. But effectively, you know, we have a chart here from the IPCC presentation with temperatures rising that is concurrent with, with our emissions of carbon, especially post-industrial revolution. Um, those two things are, are tied together. A lot of climate work has been done, um, and certainly people like Professor Greer could give a lot more color on this, but the one and a half degree kind of marker here in terms of global average temperature increase is a generally accepted rule of thumb as to when we would cross over into some pretty material um, changes in our surface processes, you know, here on planet Earth. And a lot of those are, are really considered to be irreparable or irrecoverable. Um, and so the main goal and the broad consensus is to stay under that. Really in the last couple of years, a lot of work and attention has been paid to not just getting to net zero and, and increasing above that temperature mark by, by the year 2050, but really the pathway by which we do that. So how, how quickly and how fast we can do that is becoming critical. Um, and, and so I'll talk, I'll touch a little bit on why that's important, especially to the large integrated energy companies. Uh, this chart in the top right, um, just for, for scale, this is our global energy use. And you can see 2020 with, with the pro forma forecast from a firm I'll touch on later. Um, but you can see the blip that we had during COVID during our economic shutdowns. So, you know, shut down all, you know, uh, air traffic, um, a lot of economies were completely closed and you know, we saw a four to five percent reduction in total energy use. So you can see my, my statement above on the top of the slide just seems really unfeasible for you know, human society to materially reduce the amount of energy we're using. So the problem statement here is really how do we get to net zero, you know, maintaining quality of life, hopefully improving quality of life while also creating you know, sustainable um, economic engine um, and, and energy complex for the long run to do that. So where do these emissions come from? Uh, Professor Hamilton touched on this a little bit, but transportation, obviously a huge part, but, but you can see how these different resources, oil, natural gas, coal, and then non-energy impact our emissions. And so just for some scale today, global emissions are around 50 gigatons uh, per annum by 2050. Broad consensus will be at 80 gigatons per, at, per annum of carbon you know, equivalent being emitted. And so that really permeates all aspects of life from buildings to transportation to agriculture and how much forest or deforestation we have is huge. So a couple of these things like passenger vehicles um, contribute to about 10% of global emissions today. That, that's not a shock to most people, but, but other things, for example, cement production being 6%, um, deforestation contributing, you know, leading 11 to 12 percent and actually surpassing a number of other what I think are, are perceived as high emissions activities. And so, again, here, just making the point that you know, when we think about curbing our emissions and what that forcing function looks like, it's really not just an energy question. It, it, it permeates all aspects of the economy and, and civilization. So, you know, when we think about climate tech and, and ways to address that. Um, we'll get into what some of the broader energy companies think about that. Um, it's really trying to find ways to address that in, in all these different verticals. 
So you know, I think a lot of people um, you know, on the right might say climate change is still a hoax, which, which you know, don't need to go there. A lot of people on the left you know, would say you know, this is a, a, a catastrophe and is it too late, which is a fair question to ask. Um, but I, I would just say as, as kind of a pragmatist and, and a bit of a centrist, you know, is there hope? Yes. And so we're lucky the United States is an example. We've actually had declining CO2 emissions now, nowhere near on the order of what we need to achieve our goals. Um, and, and, and to be in a place where I think broadly everyone feel a lot more comfortable about sustainable future. But you can see GDPs continue to increase, emissions have started to come down, and a number of other countries, you know, could pick the UK as an example, have seen 20% reduction in CO2. This was between 2004 and 2015, while also increasing GDP 30%. So there is some hope, and I'll go to a number of the technologies that, that provide hope. Professor Hamilton touched on uh, as well, but you know, really just need to go faster. So how should we think about these solutions? You know, we think of them as kind of a triangle. So one leg of the triangle is technology uh, readiness level, TRL, which is a, a NASA system of, of quantifying you know, how ready for, for scaling a technology might be. And what is the emissions impact? So how much of the 50 gigatons today or 80 gigatons in the future are we offsetting? And then what, what is the cost today? And one thing I would point out, we'll go into more detail, aligns directly with what Professor Hamilton was talking about. You can look at material intensity and emissions intensity by energy sources. And you can see that these fossil fuel sources, you know, are very low material intensity because they have high energy density, but they have a lot of emissions tied, tied to that. Um, and so a lot of the renewable energy sources, very low emissions, but are very high in material intensity. So that's something that that we need to address um, and, and, and figure out what that looks like when we bring those technologies to scale. Just to dive into that a little bit, because I think it's important um, and ties into the broader energy companies and, and some of the traditional mining companies as well, more importantly, you know, what are some of these critical materials? So aluminum, cobalt, copper, lithium, using lithium as an example here, this chart charts um, lithium's historical demand versus its, its forecasted future demand uh, to, to maintain a one and a half degree Celsius uh, increase in global temperature and the delta between that. So you can see, for example, if we really are gonna proliferate renewables the way we need to um, and provide the battery storage associated with that, if we're gonna electrify automobiles um, in the way that we need to to get, get to a sustainable future, we're really short our, our minerals like lithium, uh, neodymium is another one that's huge, uh, all, all the ones on this list. And so trying to be mindful about how do we need to invest into this, this complex to bolster the production and frankly find the reserves that, that we don't have today in order to do that. I, I'm confident we'll be able to do that. We did that in, in you know, oil and gas and coal uh, historically. So we should be able to do that here um, with the, this new energy economy. Critical elements is what, what our firm refers to them as. Um, it's just trying to find the, the effort and the resources to do that. So, so this is a, a very busy chart, but it's one of my favorite charts. This is a, a firm called Thunderset Energy, which you can go sign up for their newsletter. Um, this, this is looking at all the technologies that they've reviewed, and, and I've spent some time on almost all of these, um, and, and the speakers next week will be very familiar with, with a lot of these, looking at the cost per, per ton of CO2 abated by technology, and, the, and then on the x-axis, the impact to abated um, CO2 in terms of tons. So you can see, for example, reforestation, relatively cheap, less than $50 a ton of abatement cost, and, and could offset a lot of CO2 on the order of 20 gigatons. And we could do that you know, today, basically, and, and some huge movements in the markets to help do that. You can see a lot of different technologies with different charts and, and for example, renewables, uh, which Eric will get into next, not you know one solution, for example, similar to oil and gas. There are areas where that's highly economic today. Other areas, you know, as you get higher up uh, latitudinally, get a little bit more difficult. So for example, renewables with batteries, high cost, but the best renewables, one of the lowest cost solutions we have today and a big reason why it's proliferating broadly. So one thing I'd point out here, which I, I note on the top, you know, the average uh, American is responsible for around 20 tons of CO2 uh, emissions per year. So if that median family income is $45,000 per year. If, if you're going to 
implement these technologies at 50 bucks a ton, you're talking about an incremental thousand dollars in cost, the average American family, which isn't great, but it's definitely doable. If you start implementing costs on a per ton basis of 100, 200, 300 dollars per ton, you know, you're really adding three, four, five thousand dollars of a frictional cost to the average American family. A lot of that doesn't seem doable. And America, obviously, being the wealthiest country in the world, would be much more difficult in other nations. And so at least how, how we think about this is what are broadly available solutions that are technologically ready today and, and would not cause uh, uh, you know, material inflationary impact on, on consumers. You know, will this transition be smooth and fast? The answer is, is no. We obviously need it to be as fast as possible. So hopefully we can make it fast. Smooth will, will be tough, right? And so this chart here just shows historical energy transitions over time. And typically these things take 100 years. You know, so for example, oil in 1900 was just kind of put into place and it really wasn't you know, at its peak until around 2000. So we're trying to accelerate renewables and other technologies on the order of 25 to 45 years as opposed to 100 years. And, and again, I'm, I'm bullish that we can do that. We'll take a lot of uh, investment and, and collaboration both on a, on a nation scale and on a private and public capital scale. And then this chart on the right, just showing that it's not a steady march. So, so some of these nations in Europe, you know, I've seen huge increases in renewable energy. Um, others have seen some increases in the past year or two in coal uh, as a result of, of some phenomena in the grid complex. So, so it won't be a, a linear march either. All right, so, so companies getting to net zero to start to transition to, to the large integrated oil and gas companies. What are companies saying they're going to do? This is a chart from, from the same firm. Um, plotting out 630 companies, uh, their different net zero commitments and targets by, um, by year and by industry. So not surprising, the most aggressive targets, which are green and blue here, uh, are, are the near-term years. Those are net zero targets between 2000 and 2030 uh, are renewable companies. And then um, energy, uh, not energy dense industries. So internet, healthcare, professional services, as you get to you know, real assets like air transport, utilities, mining minerals and energy, their commitments are further out. That makes total sense. But, but I think this is interesting. This is the only chart I've seen that's actually mapped uh, hundreds of companies net zero commitments. And so what we'll start to look at here is the energy companies and the utilities. What, what are they gonna do to get to net zero? Before we do that, though, I, I thought it's important to note, you know, a lot of people would, would frame, and, and, and rightly so until very recently, you know, what are the, the efforts of these energy companies in terms of getting to net zero, supporting sustainability, recognizing climate change? Um, and I would just point out, um, without going to a lot of the, the historical back and forth, the last two years have really been an unprecedented time in terms of capital formation in this space and a real pivot, I would say globally, and, and, and especially in the US, between supporting expansion of oil and gas and really the proliferation of these new technologies that are required for net zero. And so this is a chart on private equity funds raised, uh, energy funds raised by type. So this is when I got into oil and gas, private equity, things were awesome. Uh, funds start getting precipitously smaller uh, to almost non-existent today in a span of six years. And if you know anything about private equity, that's extremely fast. These funds are raised on 10 year cycles. Um, you've seen the proliferation of renewable funds and, and have some more charts on climate tech. Um, and this is just in the private sector. If you include the public spe uh, SPAC sector over the last two years, these numbers would be much, much higher on the order of $100 billion plus raised. So I, I point to these. Um, and then on this side, you can see uh, private equity energy deal activity just declining rapidly for fossil fuels. Um, just to show that you know, capital formation is, is rapidly happening in the space on the private side which is usually a leading indicator of what happens in the public markets. So what, what is causing this? Why, why are companies suddenly paying attention? Uh, you know, all of these headlines in aggregate. It's the endowments saying they're not going to invest in fossil fuels. Those are the largest investors in, in private equity funds. You've seen growth and investment commitments by a lot of these institutional investors, which aren't just endowments. It's, it's some of the, the pension plan funds and institutions as well. Probably most importantly, and the reason I have it front and center is you know, regardless of who's in office, really, you know, BlackRock and the large asset managers, which would be BlackRock, you know, Wellington, T. Rowe Price, are the largest shareholders by far globally of these public shares. And they've essentially said, hey, we think about things on a 30, 40 year timeline. 
everything you know, has to be considered in, in the uh, context of sustainability and net zero because we think it's a critical issue you know on that timeline and so they've really driven a lot of this um and, and then you go to somewhere like europe where uh, lawsuits have started to be filed against companies like shell and then even in the us which i think we're, we're a long ways from something like this and still tbd on how this plays out in the us you had engine number one um you know, hold twelve and a half million dollars of Exxon Mobil shares, and successfully lead a complete remake of Exxon Mobil's board of directors with the support of the likes of BlackRock um, and, and you know the largest non-government-owned energy company in the world, um, which is just astounding. You know, ten years ago that would have been unfathomable. And I'll, I'll get to Exxon Mobil and, and, and their plans and how drastically those have changed in the last couple of years. Um, so, energy sector specifically, you know, really. Everyone talks about carbon, but there's a number of greenhouse gas emissions that are important. Um, methane on a, on a hundred year timeline is 25 times more potent uh, than CO2 on a per ton equivalent basis. On a 20 year timeline, because it's re reservoir life in the atmosphere is shorter, it can be 80 times more potent. And so really trying to capture all the future of methane emissions that we can in the near term is super impactful to that pathway to net zero. How fast do we get to net zero? And so energy companies, you know, control a lot of these methane molecules, um, you know, methane, future methane emissions break down into two sectors, really. It's half energy uh, companies, half landfills and waste management, which, which we can get to. And those are starting to, to intersect in something called renewable natural gas. But methane emissions are, are huge and, and put up this uh, chart of the largest methane emitters, because I think a lot of times people get tied up in ExxonMobil or BP. And in reality, there's a number of companies that are larger emitters than those. Um, primarily midstream companies have a lot of future methane emissions and then private companies. So, you know, there's a company here in Houston that, that's owned by a, a well-known guy in this town called Hillcorp Energy. You know, probably most people on this call have never heard of Hillcorp Energy. It is a large private company that's managed very well, but they have a lot of emissions. It's, it's a huge uh, producer of oil and gas. So it's not just you know, Exxon, Chevron, if you'll note, isn't even on this list because they have pretty top of the line, um, you know, operations already, but but some more improvements needed. Um, but it's it's not your typical who's who. There's a lot of other companies involved here. So so what are these companies actually doing? Um, and first, the, the, the first decision is, should they invest in new technologies or divest their oil and gas assets? So you saw the European firms start divesting assets in a very meaningful way. That's the chart here on the right um, compared to their low carbon investment. So Shell had that lawsuit brought to them. They effectively decided the easiest thing to do would be to reduce the denominator, how many oil and gas assets they hold, and immediately started divesting large assets, the biggest one being the Permian Basin here, um, in, in conjunction with material new investment. But you know, I, I think that the, the speed and race to divest assets has immediately come into question because you're not really reducing any emissions, you're just handing it off to someone else who frankly probably isn't as good or mindful an operator as, as the company logo as you see there. Um, so I suspect that'll start to slow in the near term. And then what are the investments going towards at these companies? And so a lot of it's this methane mitigation, just tracking fugitive methane emissions and mitigating those. A lot of it's into you know, alternative fuels like renewable diesel, RNG, which is renewable natural gas, renewable power, which is solar and wind and battery storage, and e-mobility, which is EVs and the associated charging stations. So start to go through a couple examples of, of what some of these companies are doing. BP considered kind of a, a thought leader, at least in, in their pivot and how quickly they've pivoted to be a, a renewable, sustainable energy company. Um, don't necessarily have time to go through all this, but we can just see they're trying to get to net zero very quickly um, and really ha have astounding goal for 2030 to get to 9 billion of EBITDA from their um, you know, existing sustainability business. They're already earning a billion in EBITDA and they're investing on the order of three to $9 billion per year. So I think there's a little bit of a view on um, you know, climate activists that energy companies aren't doing enough. A lot of what I'm about to show you has happened only in the last two years. So that, that argument probably was fair until the last couple of years. But um, you know, really now the, the scale of what these companies are starting to do are, are becoming evident. Um, you know, BP is making a big push into EV mobility, into alternative fuels, 
And they probably more than any other of the large integrated companies have made a bet in, in wind, namely offshore wind projects, which are underdeveloped and, and large scale solar assets. Um, and so that they're already now one of the largest owners of, of renewable power in the world. Exxon Mobil, um, had, so really a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, Exxon Mobil publicly acknowledged climate change was a problem. Um, but but had basically touted natural gas in, in, a, in a repositioning of their portfolio to be more natural gas heavy as, as kind of sufficient acts, uh, action to address that. Given the board shakeup last year, they have now completely pivoted into becoming a, a more sustainable energy business and all the figures, and they've got a lot of great stuff on their website. Um, you know, they've put out a lot of materials, all of that in the last nine months, really, to set out a strategic plan as to how they do this. ExxonMobil is committed to $15 billion of investment over the next six years, or around $1 billion ramping to $4 billion um, in a very short time period, which averages out to roughly 10% of CapEx, so just a huge number for, for a large global integrated energy company. They think about this as upstream product solutions and then low carbon solutions. Low carbon solutions now is a new group that's going to report directly to the board and the CEO. Under low carbon solutions, they're looking at renewable fuels, uh, which include renewable diesel. They, they have a huge investment in plant out in California um, that will start ramping up next year. Hydrogen, which I've kind of highlighted here, um, they're looking to do a lot with hydrogen. And then really more than any other, they've started looking at CCS or, or carbon capture storage. And so carbon capture storage is the permanent sequestration of carbon. So when we think about having to be net zero on 50 gigatons today or 80 gigatons in the future, you know, we're always going to have emissions no matter you know, what energy source we use. So how do we actually, you know, have negative emissions in some activity? And probably the, the most scalable, um, impactful one will be carbon capture and sequestration, which the large integrated energy companies definitely are, are at an advantage. It's a lot of the same technology and skill sets. Uh, used to extract oil and gas, you're just pumping it down in reverse. Um, and so not a surprise that that Exxon is really kind of putting their chips out there. In addition, here in Houston, they're proposing a CCS innovation zone, um, which is really exciting. And a number of other the large energy companies are, are looking at that as well. Um, and, and just as a, a, an aside, more capital got committed in Houston private equity to CCS in the fourth quarter of last year than to all upstream combined, which is, again, kind of an astounding number. Chevron has committed to 10 billion in investment over the next six years. They look very similar to ExxonMobil's plans, uh, but I think have made a little bit bigger bet on renewable natural gas, which is trying to capture the methane that's emitting from landfills in agricultural activity, cow and, and pig manure effectively. And so how do we capture that methane and then, you know, use it by using the methane, you're converting it to much less potent carbon dioxide. It's also, you know, uh, synergistic with existing infrastructure. So they've spent a fair amount of time on RNG. They're looking at CCUS solutions and have done a lot in renewable diesel as well. Um, I wouldn't be shocked to see Chevron do some, some things in renewable power, similar to the European firms. Um, but for now, I think really spending most of their time on, on renewable fuels, uh, hydrogen, uh, renewable diesel, and renewable natural gas. Now, lastly, I wanted to give an example from one of the utility companies. So this is XL Energy, which is a huge utility in the Midwest. Um, you can see kind of the states they, they operate in. Um, they have a goal. They're the most aggressive utility in the United States by far to be zero coal in their uh, energy portfolio mix by 2030. They're already meaningfully on the way to doing that. Um, they've already uh, reduced emissions since 2014 by 50%, which is really an astounding number and, and should easily be able to get to zero emissions by 2050. You can see their energy mix, you know, in 2005, they were 56% coal. In 2030, they will be 3% coal. You can see the, the rapid ramp in renewable adoption rate here, at both solar and wind. Part of that is a little fortuitous for them because of the locations they operate in. Those are very prospective for wind and solar, so they have better, uh, you know, better prospectivity for that than others. Um, so, so an interesting case study with Excel. And lastly, a uh, couple of things: just decarbonizing certain sectors. Second time, that's capital, just great. Where, uh, where is capital going? So it's really, you know, these sectors here, and then have a chart, which I'm sure next week they'll get into. You know, where is VC going by sector? You can see a lot of money was spent in mobility early on, 
And now people are really starting to spend money in, in some of these energy, um, new energy technologies. And then lastly, won't go through this, but um, I'm sure next week they might touch on this, how you map out, you know, investing in climate tech and sustainable um, you know, technology is difficult. And so there's a lot to it. Would encourage people to visit uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures uh, website or the Engines website, Breakthrough is Bill Gates' is fund. Um, and so you can see here, th there's a lot, a lot of different ways to invest in, and make a difference in, uh, in this journey that we're all collectively on. Um, again, we'll just wrap up by saying, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I think a lot has changed in the last two years. If we continue changing at that accelerated rate, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of progress made between now and 2028 and the 2030 goal, goals, which we will uh, definitely need. So I'll stop there and uh, pass it off to Eric. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. So I'm Eric Curran, and I work for a solar company. And I'm very glad to work for a solar company. Every day, I remember how high the stakes are in what we do. And I think you've seen from, from Bill and Brian's presentations that climate and energy are complicated subjects. Um, so I think it's helpful to remember that these really complicated subjects connects to very simple but important things in our lives. And I'm reminded that George Washington's birthday is today, and in my book, The Solar Patriot, I made an analogy between the American Revolution and the Clean Energy Revolution. Of course, energy was a lot simpler in uh, George Washington's day. It was very distributed, uh, which is actually the future that those of us in the solar industry would like to see, uh, rather than a bunch of complex, centralized energy resources uh, we'd like to see more energy made in local communities. Now, I'll get to that at the end of my presentation. But um, of course, we all know that George Washington helped the United States win uh, as the underdog, an incredibly difficult fight against the world's greatest military power. Um, and to establish a model of government, of uh, self-government and of um, equality, uh, democracy and a repu re democratic republic that is spread around the world. Uh, at the time of the American Revolution, the world was governed by kings and caliphs and popes and czars and despots of all sorts. And now, though democracy is not entirely triumphant, the norm uh, around the world is the liberal democratic ideal. Most nations are a republic. Uh, whether they live up to that or not, the ideal is, is the ideal that George Washington helped establish in 1776. America was the leader, even as a, a, a tiny power. Now we're the world's greatest power, and I think we can be a leader again. And the stakes are as high as they were in George Washington's day, and perhaps higher, because I think we're talking about the future of humanity. And we've had a very even keel tone so far, and there's been a lot of numbers and a lot of discussions of technology, but really what we're talking about is people. We're talking about the future of people, the future of civilization, and the future of a livable life on Earth. I don't think we should ever forget that what we're doing here is actually extremely important and the stakes are very high that we get it right. And so I'm so glad to be working in solar power and I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen. And so um, my presentation will be a, a little bit simpler, but I hope it will um, leave you not only informed, um, but also inspired. So I really do believe that solar power has a major role to play in saving the climate. Um, and, and, and it's not just that solar power is clean, that's an important part. Um, but there's other aspects of solar power that are also important. Why do, we, why do we want clean energy in the first place? And we don't use the term alternative energy, it's not alternative anymore. Uh, solar power, wind power, they work, uh, they're proven, and uh, they're ready to go. So uh, it's clean energy, that's why we use it, and it's renewable. And so yes, we need to fight climate change, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from dirty energy, which is the main source of greenhouse gas emissions in industrial society. Um, but we also, um, you know, even if that energy weren't dirty, it would run out someday, fossil fuels would peak, and the prices would start to rise, and that would destroy our economy. So renewable power is important uh, for our economic strength as well. 
and for our national security and for um, racial justice and equity. This is something that people don't often think about. Many of the most polluting fossil fuel facilities are located in communities where the folks are overwhelmingly low income and overwhelmingly people of color. So if you go to a place uh, in Louisiana with the terrible name of Cancer Alley, it's an area along the river from New Orleans to Baton Rouge, uh, covered in chemical uh, plastics plants and refineries. And the folks who live there, some of them are African-Americans whose families got their land right after reconstruction. These are historic pieces of land with such cultural significance in our society and, and land which maybe used to be a, a sugar plantation uh, run by enslaved people is now a plastics plant run by some company from Asia. And it is polluting the exact same people whose ancestors worked on the sugar plantation. And so there's a sort of a, uh, a, a poetic justice in helping these folks uh, to clean up their environment, um, whether there was climate change or not. Uh, those of us who don't live next to an oil refinery, it's easy for us to care only about climate change. But as Bill McKibben says, the climate movement has become the climate justice movement. And we never should have decided that there were sacrifice zones. We never should have decided that there was okay to have places in America where the people were so poor and powerless that they just had to suck up uh, getting their air and water polluted. That was never right, and it certainly isn't right today. So there are so many reasons to go to clean renewable energy, and solar power is uh, one of the two uh, sources of clean renewable energy that has the most potential for growth, along with wind power. So Bill Hamilton will tell you that, you know, one of the things we need to do uh, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, and as Bryant said, to keep our standard of living up, is we need to electrify everything. So about 90% of our transportation today runs on liquid fuels. Well, those are mostly fossil fuels. You could make liquid fuels from biofuels. You could make hydrogen. You could replace liquid fuels with hydrogen, but that's not what we have today. What we have is a transportation system that runs mostly on gasoline and diesel fuel and uh, jet fuel. Um, and so the most promising way to cut the emissions from our, the transportation sector, which is, I think Brian showed you, was the biggest single source, uh, passenger vehicles, or, or maybe the second source, um, is to electrify all vehicles. And that's, that's very doable. Um, fortunately, what is happening? Fortunately, solar power uh, can help. Uh, of course, once we electrify those vehicles and, and everything else that runs on fossil fuels, uh, we need a clean source of electricity. People sometimes ask me, oh, if I get an electric car and plug it into the grid, isn't it just as bad as driving a gasoline car? Well, it's true that the grid doesn't have a lot of clean energy on it. We'll get to that in a minute. But even, if the, even with today's grid, running an electric car is still better for the environment than running a gasoline car. So just remember that. But, um, but the good news is that there is more and more solar on the grid. If you look at this chart, you'll see that since 2009, I mean, the, the numbers don't matter. What matters is that stuff's going up. Uh, we've, utility uh, scale solar has greatly increased. And as it's increased, the price of utility scale solar has gone down. So that now for many utilities, uh, integrated resource plans, including uh, Dominion here in Virginia, but it's true across the country, Solar is the least cost source of new generation. I mean, just try to get that through your head. Utilities are not necessarily choosing solar uh, because they're good people, because they care about climate change. And of course they have to, because they're being pressured to, um, but they're choosing it because it's cheap. Solar has become much cheaper than coal and even cheaper than natural gas in many parts of the country. The solar has made an incredible amount of progress in terms of uh, uh, affordability, and of course, that's helped it spread. But things can spread at a high rate when they're small. And you can have a chart that shows them going you know, way up, uh, but they're still fairly little compared to uh, what needs to be done. And here's another chart. Uh, if you see the pie chart here, you'll see that renewable energy as of 2019, which this probably hasn't changed that much, um, renewable energy was only 11%. Uh, of America's energy sources at the time. And petroleum and natural gas were still uh, the largest sources. Coal had indeed decreased, which is very good news. 
Um, but those numbers Bill is talking about, about natural gas continuing to increase until 2050, well, that's a problem. Natural gas may burn cleaner than coal, but in its entire life cycle, natural gas, some scientists say, is not cleaner than coal because of uh, fugitive methane emissions from, from wells and from uh, transmission and distribution. So I kind of hope natural gas doesn't keep increasing until 2050. I think we need to find a way to level that off much sooner. Um, and, and solar and wind can help. But as you see, if you break out this renewable energy uh, slice of the pie, uh, and, and you know, solar was in 2019, only 9% of renewable energy. And look at the kind of silly stuff they counted as renewable energy. You know, God bless the Energy Information Administration. Um, you know, wood, biofuels, and a lot of that biomass waste. A lot of this stuff doesn't really qualify as clean energy. Um, and, and hydroelectric, which, you know, Bill, Bill said it's, it's got its problems. You're damming up rivers and such. But the main problem in hydro is there's just no place for it to grow in the United States. All the dam, all the good hydro sources have been dammed up a long time ago. Some of that hydroelectric goes back to World War II. So that's nothing to be proud of, that we get a lot of power from hydroelectric. Um, so really what we're looking at is wind and solar. And wind is, is doing very well. Uh, and, and solar is growing. But we need a lot more solar, folks. Uh, if we're going to uh, meet the climate goals that scientists say we need to meet by 2030, 2035, and even 2050, we need to quadruple or 10x the amount of solar that we have today. Now, the good news is the electric utilities have gotten on board. Again, I'm not going to, I work for a small solar company. You can imagine how I feel about electric utilities. I'm glad that today they've gotten on board with solar. But let's not forget that until just a few years ago, electric utilities were some of the biggest roadblocks towards America getting more solar because a lot of them own natural gas assets and they thought the next thing was natural gas and they were holding on to that with a death grip. And so you could see that utilities really didn't do much with solar in 2010, 2011, 2012. It's not that long ago uh, that utilities were going, no. Uh, you know, we're, we're fine with natural gas. We're building pipelines. Thank you very much. Finally, utilities started to get the message. Uh, and I'm glad they did. Now they're bu building huge solar arrays all over the place. Of course, that has its own issues, uh, eating up farmland. Uh, some communities don't like to have what's essentially an industrial facility in their rural area. So that's an issue that the country is going to have to deal with. And I think it might wind up restraining the growth of utility scale solar. You know, there, for those of you who don't work in the energy, energy industry, there's sort of three sizes of solar. There's utility scale, which is big solar farms. Uh, there's uh, residential scale, which is homes. And then in the middle, on this chart, it's called non-residential. That's not a very catchy name. Uh, we call it commercial scale solar. And so you see the, the, the dark blue uh, and the yellow uh, at the bottom of these, these bars. And they're both going to grow. Probably the residential uh, is growing more than the commercial, but they're both slated to grow. I think each of those needs to grow a lot more uh, than, than they're slated to on this chart. And for that to happen, a lot of public policy need, changes need to happen that sort of favor utilities over um, people who produce small scale solar, uh, which I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A if anybody cares. But anyway, whether solar comes from utilities or it's on the rooftop of your house or it's on top of Washington and Lee, uh, which counts as commercial scale solar, um, the way to get the maximum amount of benefit out of clean energy is to have a smart grid. It's to have a grid that has um, two-way transmission, not just one-way transmission, as you see on the left here. You know, that's the old-fashioned coal-burning electrical grid system. You got a big coal plant or nuclear plant or, uh, you know, a, a, you got a dam and they're just shooting power out to their customers. Uh, you know, that's the old fashioned clunky uh, 20th century model of the electrical grid. The new 21st century model, which we're going to need to incorporate clean energy uh, and, and storage is the model on the right which is more of a web. Uh, it's more like the World Wide Web. It's more like the internet. And it's a smart grid that is a two-way system that you know, you've still got utilities, but you've also got people making power at their homes, at their businesses, 
at schools, and then you've got distributed resources all over the place, and then you've got storage all over the place too. And this is one of the most exciting things. You know, you've got the, the vehicle chargers, and then the vehicles themselves can serve as battery storage. Um, and, and all of this is connected in like little neighborhood sized grids called a microgrid, which, you know, if they, uh, you remember the, uh, the power outage in Texas, uh, I guess it was last winter, I think, um, you know, if they, if they had had a better grid system, they wouldn't necessarily have suffered so badly in those winter storms. If you had a bunch of microgrids instead of one big grid, you could turn off parts of the grid uh, that needed to go down and then uh, island or separate other parts of the grid and still keep the power going, especially if you had distributed energy resources uh, like solar and wind, they were still able to produce. So this is the energy grid of tomorrow. Um, and here's what I wanna leave you with. It's an image for just what's so special about the smart grid, about the two-way energy grid and uh, a clean energy solution that solves a lot of other solutions in society too. So I don't know if uh, any of you rode the bus to school when you were kids. Um, maybe your parents drove you to school, maybe you walked to school, um, but a lot of kids ride the school bus. In fact, there are 500,000 school buses currently operating in the United States. It's the nation's largest transit system. When you put all school buses together, um, it's quite a lot of buses. Well, 95% of them currently run on diesel fuel. If you've ever driven behind a uh, school bus or stood next to one while you're putting your kid on the bus, you know that they smell terrible and they're noisy. Well, that nasty smell isn't just unpleasant and it's not just on the outside of the bus. That nasty smell indicates that all sorts of pollution from diesel fuel is going into the air. It's going into the air outside the bus, but unfortunately, it's also polluting the air inside the bus. And in fact, the air inside a school bus that those kids are breathing every day that they ride to school twice a day, and sometimes for field trips, can be up to 12 times more polluted than the air outside. And so the kids are breathing in lead and PCBs and all sorts of other stuff that can give them cancer in the long run and in the short run can cause respiratory ailments like asthma. And because kids are developing more quickly than adults, they breathe in a lot more air per body volume than we do. And their um, nervous system is developing, their brain system is developing. And so it can also lead to reduced performance in school because the kids can't pay attention. And so um, it's also a question of racial equity because who rides the school bus more than other kids? It's low income kids, it's kids who don't have parents who can afford to drive them to work or can't take off. So a disproportionately large amount of low income kids who are disproportionately um, black and people of color ride school buses. And they are the folks who are exposed the most to the pollution from diesel school buses. All right, so you've got a bunch of problems here. And by the way, have you seen the cost of diesel fuel these days? It's through the roof. It's like a dollar more than gasoline. And so imagine these school divisions that are already strapped uh, for funds. They don't have an extra slush fund that they can draw on when the price of diesel fuel goes up. They've got the uh, buckets in the hallway, you know, to catch the dripping from the ceiling because they can't afford to fix their roof. They can't afford to pay their teachers and their aides. Where are they going to get money to pay for a, a, a premium diesel fuel? So um, this uh, diesel buses are a bad deal for our kids' schools for a variety of different reasons. But so far, there hasn't been much of an alternative until now. Electric buses are now practical. Uh, the average electric school bus can get 100 miles on a single charge, which is enough to cover 80% of routes for school buses. There are some electric buses that can get more than 500 miles on a charge. They're very expensive today, and they're not commercially practical. But in five years, that seems to indicate that the average school bus will probably be able to cover the majority of school bus routes on a single charge. They're clean, they're quiet, school kids love them, school bus drivers love them, they're as powerful as they need to be, uh, and they're just as safe as any other bus. 
There's one catch though, and that's upfront cost. The average diesel school bus costs about $100,000. The average electric school bus costs about three times that much, 300 or $350,000. So again, with school budgets being the way they are, that high upfront cost is a huge barrier to schools converting their fleets from dirty diesel to clean electric buses. Well, there are a variety of government grant programs available and, and the uh, plan just passed, uh, you know, I think in January uh, in Congress, uh, we'll have something like $5 million for alternative fuel buses. I think two and a half, five billion, two and a half billion will go towards EVs and two and a half billion towards other technologies. Um, but that's a drop in the bucket. That's uh, one or two school buses per school district around the country. In order to electrify uh, hundreds of thousands of buses, there needs to be a different financial model. And I think one of the most promising is to offer the buses to the school districts, not as a product that they have to buy and pay for upfront, but as a service. And many uh, technology uh, offerings in society have now gone to being offered as a service. And so if you offer school buses uh, on a subscription basis, for example, to a school district, uh, they don't have to pay anything upfront. They get the school bus and they can use it for 12 or 15 years, just like they would use a, a diesel bus, but all they pay is a monthly fee. And the monthly fee is about the same as what it would have cost them uh, to buy and, and uh, maintain their own buses. So I just wanna leave you with this. School buses are not the uh, largest amount of vehicles in America. You know, of course, we're talking about passenger vehicles. We're talking about um, heavy duty trucks. We're talking about um, trains, but school buses solve so many problems at once they deal with our kids, which people care about a lot, and they're very visible. So to see an electric school bus in your community is going to spread the gospel of electric vehicles um, in a way that will create demand among consumers and citizens for more electric vehicles. So I would leave you with the image of the humble school bus. Our kids deserve a clean ride. And if we give our kids a clean ride, this will be one way, one very concrete, simple way to help move the clean energy revolution forward even faster. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. So on to our, our Q&A. Thank you, three of you, very, very much for, for all of that information. Um, I just want to move quickly because we're going to be pushed for time and we have some great questions in the Q&A. And, and the first one that I want to pose um, probably to Bryant, because you talked about this um, and some of the work that's going on in Houston it has to do with carbon capture and storage. And there are about three or four questions about different aspects of it in the Q&A. And I'll just put it into sort of one in an area that, that I've been thinking about recently is, you know, 20 years ago, I was a huge fan and a big proponent of carbon capture and storage. I think it's too late. Um, and people were asking about, is this just greenwashing now? Does it just promote the continued use of fossil fuels because we can get to net zero instead of gross zero? So I'm wondering if you could address some of those realities about carbon capture and storage, Brian, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, look, I, I think whether it's carbon capture or direct air capture, um, we are going to have to pull carbon out of the atmosphere some way, somehow. Um, and, and so I would say that's probably a pretty generally accepted principle in, in our world. Um, and even if you look at direct air capture, you know, there's several large companies, Bill Gates back company, um, some really exciting new ones. Um, they are still reliant on CCS systems to then take that carbon and permanently sequester it. I would say um, to date, you know, historically, a lot of CCS has been pumped into existing oil and gas reservoirs as like enhanced oil recovery. Um, the interest in that has rapidly dissipated as people are looking for permanent sequestration and not like enhanced oil recovery. Um, and so the carbon credits, uh, the, the pricing of carbon credits associated with permanent sequestration, you, know, you can see 100 to $400 a ton uh, per credit, you know, reflect, I think, the societal uh, you know, optics or, or demand for that product. In terms of technically, look, there's a lot to, to learn, just like in oil and gas reservoirs, every, every location is different, a ton of considerations. Um, but I would say overall, it's, it, it is you know, occurring. Uh, Oxy has a big project, BP has a big project. 
one of my buddies is actually the technical lead on, on a lot of those. Um, so I think it's totally feasible. It, it is not without risk. So obviously the biggest one being, you know, can you fully contain the plume? Or at some point, does the subsurface plume come to the surface, which defeats the whole purpose? Or, you know, if, if you're paying a royalty to a landowner, does it get off their minerals effectively, which would almost get to the social justice issues that, that Eric was referring to. Um, so so definitely not without without its risk or considerations, but I think will be a critical uh, tool in the tool belt going forward. Thank you so much for that, Eric. Appreciate it. Rob, do you want to pose a question for us? Yes. Um, Andrew Boyd has a, 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 a simple question for Eric, although the answer may be difficult. He says that small scale solar and electric vehicles uh, hurt gas tax and utility costs for transmissions. How can we solve this imbalance? Well, ga gas taxes, gas tax was never a good way to raise money for um, transportation projects. Um, it's a very regressive tax that has hurt the poor more than anybody else. So there needs to be a better way to find money to build roads. There are ideas uh, to, to fund them. Um, you know, honestly, it, it could be some form of tolls. People hate tolls, but I don't see why people shouldn't pay to use roads who, who use a lot of roads. But there are, there are other ways to pay for roads. But gas tax is a terrible one. I wouldn't mind seeing the gas tax go away tomorrow. Um, and for a tax that... Uh, you know, uh, for a, a source of funding that discourages us from using clean energy, that's just a perverse incentive that, you know, it, it, it's time has passed. Um, as far as this claim by electric utilities that solar costs ratepayers who don't have solar because they have to pay for the infrastructure uh, that, that everybody else uses and the solar homeowner, homeowners or businesses aren't buying the electricity so they're not paying their fair share. I believe that's also a talking point of the electric utility industry that uh, people in the solar industry and people who are independent have, have, have questioned. And there's been independent studies that have shown that distributed solar, in fact, more than pays for itself. Um, and that people investing their own money to put solar distributed energy resources on the grid uh, actually gives utilities and the grid a lot of, uh, a lot of financial advantages. Okay, thank you. Um, Bill, I'm going to send this question your way, and I know it's not exactly what you do, but I also know that in many of the classes that you teach, um, you talk about health consequences of, of different things within our environment. And one of the questions is basically asking about, you know, if we are able to quantify all of the health components. Eric talked a little bit about this in the context of air and water and Cancer Alley. Um, you know, if we're able to, to go about and quantify all that, doesn't that in and of itself make the renewables more cost competitive if we truly consider the health consequences of burning fossil fuels? The short answer, yes. <laughs> um, you know, and, and Eric went through a, a great example, but it, it's just our heat waves alone are causing major health distress, right? I talked about ozone in the stratosphere, but tropospheric ozone Sure. When you get an ozone warning, you get them in Texas a lot in hot areas. People with asthma, people are getting more asthma because of it. Um, the cost just of being have, having increased temperatures and causing people stress. Um, there's no doubt about it that um, if all of those things were summed up, it would it, just the the healthcare costs alone, it would justify you know shifting to renewables that much more rapidly. Yeah, it's a good question. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Um, let's uh, let's go back with uh, back to Eric uh, with this question from Mike Carr. Um, Europe's rush to alternative alternative energy has become, he he argues, an economic disaster since storage is not fully capable of long term power at a reasonable cost. Um, have you have you studied that problem uh, or at least that challenge in in Europe, Eric uh, or Bryant? If you want to take that question, which one of you would like to handle it? Uh, I can touch on it, but but defer to you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. 
Um, yeah, I guess, look, Europe has a lot of problems uh, going on right now. A lot of them geopolitical, exacerbated by some of this Russia conflict, which hopefully ends nonviolently. I guess we'll find out in the next couple of days. Um, and, and I think just that dynamic, first off, before I, I get to some of the other answers, to underscore some of Eric and, and Bill's points, like you know, there, there are a lot of other things other than dollars and like tons of carbon going in the air. I think the Russia conflict kind of underscores this right now. So, so just highlight that, but I, you know, in some countries like Germany would be a prime, prime example. I think had a huge renewable program successfully invested a lot and built a lot of that. And I think by all accounts, you know, that program is a success and what it was intended to do. The fact they retired and accelerated the retirement of nuclear plants and whether they were nuclear plants or not gas plants, I think it's, it was this um, decoupling of ramping the renewables and then retiring the base load that, that the renewables um, complemented probably just a hair too quickly. I think one thing to point out in all energy is price responds at the margin. And so all you need is very small movements in supply and demand to see outsized price signals. So I think some people pointing to Europe and saying, like, see, they moved to renewables too quickly. That's like an economic disaster. It's like a gross simplification. There's a lot going on there in terms of tax regimes, you know, nuclear plant retirements, the efficacy of these renewables. And I would also just point out as like a final comment, you know, this year's wind productivity, I think, was like one of the worst on record in like the last 40 years. Um, that's going to happen. That's a consideration when you install renewables. But I think it's a little um, disingenuous to like point to that. So, for example, if, if I pointed to you know the U.S.'s worst oil production year and said, oh, I don't know if we can fulfill our, our oil needs, um, yeah, that, that's a bit kind of cherry picking the data. So I think Europe has a lot of considerations. Definitely the acceleration of renewables, I, I don't think you can point to as a single case. Um, I think it had a lot to do with other dynamics as well. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So um, we're gonna start to push up against, I think a, a little bit of our time limit here. And so I'm gonna combine a couple of questions. There are so many great questions in the chat. Some of them are very technical and so on. And, um, and, and I appreciate everyone who has typed something in there, but I'm, I'm gonna turn to a couple of questions dealing with um, sort of the international aspects of emissions, right? Uh, the idea that we haven't talked about China and India yet, and clearly, you can't not talk about China and India in this context. And then to pile on top of that a little bit, um, Brian, you had mentioned the essential minerals questions and so on. And um, I think, you know, as many are aware, China has, has cornered the market on a lot of fair, or a lot of rare earth minerals. Uh, recently, though, I did see a great piece about the potential of the salt and sea for meeting a phenomenal amount of lithium demand. And I'm, I'm wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of what you've seen in terms of international investment uh, that may include both China and India, and then comment on that uh, essential minerals. And then when you're finished there, I think I'm going to wrap things up and I'm going to address a, a couple of our, our students um, uh, and just former student, Ali Case and Joey Dunn have a couple of questions that I want to hit on. And then I think we'll call it an evening. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so China and India, I think mean, China, obviously the largest emitter in the world, U.S. and India kind of trade off back and forth for, for that next unen unenviable position. Um, uh, in terms of foreign investment, look, uh, the, the American, uh, I guess, kind of Western world proliferation of these new technologies, um, Asian countries broadly are investing heavily. So the sovereign wealth funds, um, whether it's China, India, like a lot of the Middle East, which, which is interesting, kind of naturally hedging their, their oil and gas positions um, with these new technology investments. So they're investing as heavily as, as anyone. Um, you know, and, and China, because they are authoritarian, are moving aggressively towards installing you know, more renewables. I think they're gonna install like eight times the solar and wind we're gonna install. And, and I think we were the previous world leader in that. Um, so, so they will move quickly on a percentage basis, uh, TBD, what, what the impact will be. In terms of critical elements, yeah, China <laughs> has secured an overwhelming majority of the world's reserves. And, I'll highlight two, lithium and then something called ne neomagnets, so neodymium, um, which is super important. It's what allows wind turbines to turn motion into energy. It's in your power steering column. Um, so it's something you've never heard of, but anytime motion turns into energy or energy turns into motion, that's the result of neomagnets. China controls 90% you know, of the supply of, of the world's neomagnets. 
Um, there are some interesting things going on here domestically with people opening up new you know, neodymium uh, reserves and mines here domestically. Um, some other interesting technologies with, with new ways to manufacture those. Lithium, I'd highlight um, our fund and the engine, which one of the, the people who will speak next week is from the engine. We have an investment called Lilac. That was the company that was highlighted in the Salton Sea. They do direct lithium extraction straight from brine. So that's an example of, of an enabling technology that massively mitigates the emissions intensity of extracting lithium. So rather than having giant evaporation ponds on the surface, which, which have a ton of issues, um, you know, we can pump the lithium um, in very shallow wells straight from the reservoir, keep it all contained, run it through a sieve of sorts, capture the lithium, and then pump the water back down into the into the reservoir, um, which is much ecological benefit. So a lot of technologies like that, and you know, would look at things like our funds took a company public called Lifecycle, which is a uh, lithium battery recycling business. So all these different ways for how can we um, you know, create these kinds of critical materials without just mining them in like open pit mines and, and um, doing a bunch of damage uh, and hopefully breaking free of kind of China's hold on this. Thank you, Brian. So we'll wrap it up um, by trying to get to a couple of former environmental and natural resource economics students, Joey Dunn and Ellie Case, asking questions about incentives um, and whether or not the free market by itself can address these kinds of these big public goods types of questions. And then Ali asking about the partisan aspect of all of this and what, what could we do better there? And so I'll, I'll take a quick stab at that, wrap it up. Um, I can tell you that we're gonna talk about that stuff on Monday. So our concluding uh, webinar is going to be Monday at seven o'clock. Um, and Joey, no, the free market cannot take care of this on its own and no economist uh, would ever make that statement that until we get prices right, um, which gets to the question about healthcare costs and things of that nature and the things that Eric was referring to in terms of school children's health and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, we do need public policy that levels the playing field and in what we call internalizes the externalities uh, of the costs of producing and consuming energy without a doubt. Um, Ali, to wrap things up, to answer your question, there are two papers uh, that are readily available. One is called the conservative case for a carbon tax and the other is called the progressive case for a carbon tax. I don't think either one of those words need to be at the front of them, but they both do their own job of kind of spinning the carbon tax in such a way so that it is palatable to very different uh, aspects of, of the political spectrum. Um, again, I hate that that has to be the case, but those arguments are being made on the right as well as the left. So that is 84 minutes. And I think we're gonna call it a night. Thank you all so much. Um, this was is really important stuff. Uh, the complexity of it all was laid out, I think in a very straightforward way for us to wrap our minds around a lot of these issues. I apologize that obviously we can't get to everybody's questions. Um, but I hope some of you will, will tune in again on Monday where we'll, we'll continue this conversation and wrap things up for our five-part webinar. Thank you all. Good night. <laughs>